Hey everybody, Declan here from Flight Club. So some of you may have seen my recent video, How to Simulate a Starship Launch, uh, which I posted after the test launch of Starship SN8 back in December of last year, in which I spent a lot of time counting pixels on ice formations, pixels between frames of photographs, to try and determine the propellant levels at liftoff, the acceleration and velocity to different points of flight, try to determine the velocity of the crash landing, and then to try to apply all of these bits of information to a flight clip simulation so that the physics of the whole thing could hopefully fill in some gaps in our knowledge. Now, one thing about this method is that if you're trying to find some specific trajectory and you have a bunch of confirmed points, there are many possible trajectories that go through all of these points. Obviously, only one of those trajectories is correct and all of the other ones are wrong. Applying the constraints of the laws of physics to narrow down the set of possible solutions does make it more likely that we choose the correct one, but it doesn't guarantee it. The only way to increase the probability of choosing the correct solution is to add more data points. So I'm going to take a look at the SN9 flight using the SN8 trajectory as a sort of initial guess, uh, but then refine bits and pieces of it to match what we saw in real life. And hopefully we'll learn something new about Starship in the process, be that a better insight into Raptor's thrust, into Starship's drag coefficient, how much propellant it carries, or maybe we'll learn something new about its flip during the landing burn. So let's get started. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna start here by just taking SN8 simulation that I made as a result of all of my analysis after that launch. And I'm gonna just make sure that the engine ignition and cutoff times match what we saw on the SN9 webcast. Doing this, I actually realized that the engine cutoff times for SN8 and SN9 were almost identical. The only difference being that the final engine cutoff occurred six seconds earlier for SN9 than it did for SN8. And of course the landing timestamps were different because we're falling from a lower altitude. So fixing these things and plotting SN8 and SN9 side by side looks like this. So the first thing I notice here is that my SN9 sim is blasting through the 10 kilometer ceiling and heading on up to 12 and a half kilometers just like SN8 did. This is a pretty obvious result when you think about it, but with a few small changes to our throttle setting on the way up, we can make that altitude ceiling just a little bit lower. Here we go, much better. So one thing that I didn't model with SN8 that I really, really need to start modeling is propellant dumping. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, I'm talking about these white clouds coming off Starship during its ascent. This is liquid oxygen being dumped out of the vehicle. During my SN8 analysis, I didn't bother with simulating this because one, I didn't know that's what it was, and two, I didn't even see why I would need to do it. I mean, if I don't want that propellant, then why not just leave it out of the vehicle to begin with. Turns out it actually is necessary. Check this out. We know that the header tanks in Starship, you know, the small tanks that contain all the land propellant, will have a mass of about 30 tons of propellant inside them. And we know that they need to be full on the way down. Uh, the main tanks will probably be close to empty, so we can reasonably surmise that we'll have about 35 tons of propellant in the tanks during that descent. But in these sims, I have about 65 tons left before the landing burn. This is way too much. This is almost double what we want and is making my landing burn pretty difficult because I need to either have a much higher thrust or I'll start the burn at a much higher altitude to be able to come to a soft landing. And I can't just remove the propellant from the vehicle at the beginning because the Raptors have a minimum throttle setting. During the first phase of flight, when all three Raptors are firing, if I make the propellant mass too low, then the three Raptors have too much thrust. I need to throttle them down, but I hit that minimum throttle too quickly. And then I start to rise in altitude much too quickly because my high thrust, low mass combination gives me high acceleration. So I need to be heavy during the first phase of flight. And then once we have one of those raptors shut off, I can make the whole system lighter by dumping fuel. This is confirmed by closely watching the propellant dumps during the webcast. There is no dump occurring when all three raptors are firing. The dump only begins after the first engine cutoff. So this is the first thing that I needed to remedy. To do so, I added a new type of event to Flight Club called propellant dumping, in which the user can specify the amount of mass to be dumped over a certain time frame. The actual numbers themselves I had to completely guess. So I said that when we see this big cloud, Starship is dumping about 500 kilograms per second of propellant, and when we see this small cloud, Starship is dumping about one third of that. Using these numbers and my initial estimate for the propellant mass at liftoff, which I calculated in the SN8 video, this leaves us with 35 tons of propellant left during descent, which is much, much, much better. The other new thing that I have for SN9 is this amazing 
composite image taken and super kindly provided to me by photographer Trevor Malman. I'm sure most people watching this video already know exactly who Trevor Malman is, uh, but if you don't know, you should absolutely check out his work on launch photography. His stuff will blow you away. Anyway, the image he provided to me is a wide angle shot, uh, which contains the entire launch trajectory in a single image. Each image was taken a couple of seconds apart and then they were superimposed onto each other and the camera was never moved during the entire sequence of shots. So I can combine this with the existing photography toolkit in Flight Club and uh, set my camera at the exact location that Trevor was at, set my frame to match the camera and lens he was using, and then I can view my simulated trajectory from his point of view and compare it to what he actually saw. Then I can tweak my simulation to the point where my trajectory matches his image perfectly. It's pretty freaking cool. Now, theoretically, there are an infinite amount of trajectories that could match his image, since it's a single two-dimensional image. Ideally, there would be another camera viewing the launch at a 90 degree angle to this one, uh, which we could use to perfectly triangulate the position of Starship at all points in time. But realistically, Starship is going basically straight up and straight down with a little bit of east-west movement, so a camera on South Padre Island, i.e. directly north of the launch pad, is perfectly placed and we can, we can assume that the entire launch is in a plane perpendicular to the viewer launch pad vector. So what does my current guess look like compared to his image? It looks like this. Yeesh, that sucks, right? I didn't have any info uh, from SNA's ascent like this, so I didn't really know what to do here before. I just went straight up and then tried to figure out some way to get back down to the launch pad. But now using this photo, I can really improve that. After a bunch of iterations, here's what I've ended up with. A much, much better fit to Trevor's composite image. You may notice that, that to match this image, I even had to change the apogee of the launch. This particular simulation reaches apogee at 10.6 kilometers. SpaceX, uh, Getting a bit cheeky with their FAA permissions, perhaps? So to make the simulation work out properly, I had to nerf Starship's drag model a bit in Flight Club. Basically because I was going slightly higher, I was landing too late. So I needed to fall faster, so I decreased the drag force to make the timing work out. Not that much, but worth a mention. Also, check out the landing. Here's how the landing flip looked with my original simulation. I had to change something else in Flight Club here. Before, I had put a hard limit on how fast an object could rotate. Starship actually broke that limit during its flip, but I had overlooked that limitation in Flight Club. So my simulated flips were taking way too long and introducing way too much horizontal velocity, which gave me this over-exaggerated curve in my landing trajectory. Speeding up how fast this flip could be done meant that I didn't introduce as much horizontal velocity and I was able to cancel it out much faster. The result of that change changed the landing trajectory to look more like this. This also matches what we've seen in videos and photographs much better. Starship doesn't actually translate that much horizontally during that flip at all. So I feel this is much closer to reality. So that's showing off everything I learned about SN9 and everything I had to update in Flight Club to accommodate this new knowledge. Uh, I'll end this video with a replay of the official SpaceX SN9 stream with Flight Club overlays of all of the data from this new simulation so that you can see how the altitude, the velocity, and the throttle levels change during the flight. And instead of simulating the crash at the end, like I did with the SN8 video, I've left in the simulation of a successful landing, so you can see how it might have looked had things gone a bit better. For this successful landing simulation, I used the info that we got from John Innsbrucker during the official stream, telling us that Starship was intending to flip with two engines and decelerate a bit before switching to just one engine for the actual landing. Anyway, that's it from me. Enjoy this view of the SN9 launch, and if you like this video, please be sure to subscribe to the channel for more content like this. See you next time. N9, 
engine burning. Everything continues to look nominal right now for the stage and for propulsion. Seconds in the flight, everything continues to be nominal with Starship. We're just passing through three kilometer altitude. Next major vent is shutdown of engine number three. Plus two minutes, flight continuing on Starship. As a reminder, this is a test flight to a 10 kilometer altitude. Engine number three shut down on time as planned. We're continuing to climb on two engines. Everything continues to go well with Starship. Good engine performance so far. T plus three minutes, 20 seconds. We've shut down engine two on time. You saw that on the screen just a few seconds ago. Starship now climbing on the power of engine number one, headed to the 10 kilometer altitude. T plus four minutes. Vehicle is at 10 kilometers. It's apogee, it is at apogee. We're continuing to throttle down engine number one to hold altitude. We're preparing for handover on the propellant tank. Four and a half minutes, we are handing off to the LOX tank. We are beginning to flip to horizontal. And the white cloud, the plume you were seeing, was intentional. That is a liquid oxygen dump. We've now transitioned to horizontal and beginning the subsonic test portion of the flight, where we check out the aft and the forward flaps to hold the vehicle stability as we descend back to the landing pad. plus five and a half minutes. Starship continuing the subsonic descent using the forward and half flaps to control its attitude as we come back down to the landing pad. 
Everything continuing to go well in this portion of flight. Land intro. Six minutes, 10 seconds into flight. We're down beneath one and a half kilometers. We're preparing to restart two engines, flip the vehicle vertical, then transition to one engine for the landing burn. Let's get cameras up.